Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama, Rama Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Ramo, Ramo, Hare, 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 Krishna, Hare, Krishna, 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 Hare, Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Hare, 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 Rama, Hare, Rama, 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 Hare, Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare, 
Excuse me for that kirtan. It was like three different kirtans in one, all of which I didn't know that well. But anyway, it's the, the mood that counts. Namo Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Shami Tinamini Namaste Shadar Shati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvise Sasindivadi Paschati Dasita. Today is the most important day in American history. It's the day Prabhupada landed in America. And I was going to, I want to read the poem. It's called Markande Bhagavad Dharma. And uh, the translation is Teaching Krishna Consciousness in America. And so I thought today, um, because today is the day Prabhupada arrived, and um, I realized by picking up the book this morning that I am not that well prepared for today's class because I, I should have read more. So let's read and discuss this poem. Uh, this Prabhupada arrived first in Boston and he wrote when he was, when the ship was docked in Boston, he wrote this poem and it reveals very deeply the mood, his mood specific, specifically, but also reveals the heart, the mind, the soul, the pure devotee of Krishna. And because we're trying to learn the heart and mind and soul of a pure devotee, prayers like this are so important for us. And then so we'll try to unpack what Prabhupada is feeling. Let, let us remember that no one has um, no one has done this before. Actually, I have to um, find the whole poem. Um, excuse me. I'll keep talking while I'm somewhat distracted here. I have to get it online. Um, you know, it's easy to do something that has been done before, isn't it? You know, you know the story. Uh, doctors, physicians said that was physically humanly impossible to run a mile in four minutes. I mean, maybe if you're a greyhound dog or something, but not a human being. Physically impossible for a human being. And somehow or other, or as they say in England, somehow or, or the other, somehow or other, somebody did it. Um, that was, I believe, in 1950, and that was apparently the first time in history, at least recorded history, that anybody had run a mile in four minutes. And that year, as we were told, 50 people ran a mile in four minutes. So it's always <clears throat> difficult to break ground. It requires a certain <clears throat> depth of fearlessness and faith and, in Prabhupada's case, divine connection that doesn't exist in ordinary people. So once Prabhupada did it, then he made it easier for other people to do it because now other people see it's possible. So by him doing it, he built the faith in others so they could do it. So what Prabhupada, what Prabhupada did is remarkable in the sense that Many other devotees in the Gaudiya Mat were given this instruction. And as far as I understand, none of them thought they were capable or either they didn't think they were capable or that the job was doable, that it was possible to do. That, that Americans, Westerners, foreigners, Malechas, Yavanas, 
could become Krishna conscious, or even legally speaking, that even if they tried, they wouldn't be really devotees because of their previous samskars. So, of course, Prabhupada didn't believe that because he understood from our philosophy and from his Guru Maharaj that uh, Krishna consciousness is for everyone. And as we told the story before, Prabhupada <clears throat> felt it, he actually felt it was impossible, but the, the possible the possible factor was, well, as Guru Marsh asked him to do it. So your spiritual master is not going to tell you to do something unless he believes it could be done. So I don't think anyone believed it was possible. Any one of Prabhupada's God brothers, I don't think anyone in India believed it was possible. Of course, they were amazed. Most of them were amazed when it happened. But prior to that, it was almost like, why are you doing that? Why are you going there? Why are you... Why are you risking your life? Why are you wasting your time, etc.? And it's interesting. Also, you may know the story that Prabhupada he wanted to become part of one of the Gaudi institutions, and he wanted them to sponsor him. You know, let's make it part of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta's movement and be sponsored. You know, because this is what Bhakti said. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta wanted this, so, so Prabhupada was thinking. Well, let's do it officially as part of Gaudiya Math. I don't want to necessarily have to make it my own project. It's for the glory of our guru and the glory of his or organization. And when he made that request, mm -hmm. the reply he got was, well, just join the Math and do service here, and then we, we can talk about going to America later. It's not a priority. Just one second. Now well, you can see Prabhupada better without any glare. Yeah. Okay. I will put the curtain on that window. It keeps the room darker, but so. So they didn't, his god brothers, at least the people running the Gaudiya Math, or the one god brother running the Gaudiya Math that he wanted sponsorship with, wanted to become part of, he didn't think it was that important. So, so you have these two things going on, just so you understand, you know, the context which Prabhupada had to, had to move through and move out of and go beyond out of the box, as we say, that either it wasn't that important, it wasn't a priority in Gaudiya Math, or based on the history that previously his god brothers tried and failed that it's a failed project so why you know why try, why try again we already we already it's already been proven it doesn't work there's a little known story that when the god brothers came back they had spoken to Srila Prabhupada and, and Srila Sridhar Maharaj Prabhupada's god brother and they said that these people ask questions that cannot be answered. So they said, what, what questions do they ask? And so they posed the questions and Sridhar Maharaj Prabhupada answered the questions. And either Sridhar Maharaj or Prabhupada said, today the West has been defeated. So, you know, it shows that they, they were not afraid. Prabhupada didn't think Obviously, Prabhupada didn't think it was impossible. He just, he didn't know how to, he didn't know, he didn't really know what to expect. And so now he's in this context in which nobody has faith that this is going to happen. Nobody's even thinking of doing it. Nobody's supporting him in doing it, you know. So when people don't support you, it's, it sends a strong message that what you're doing is, is not worth it, isn't it? You know, yeah. So, so it shows something about um, Prabhupada's. I mean, you could say it shows something about his his dedication. Um, of course, it does. And we saw once he came what dedication looks like. But I think here it shows more about his faith, or pri or form. First and foremost, it shows his faith because he came because he had faith. 
this is what my guru wants me to do. I must do it. I'm a disciple. I have to do what he says. Uh, yesterday I was talking to a god brother and he said, how do you remain self-disciplined? And I said, only because um, I feel like spiritually I'm not very smart and Srila Prabhupada is a spiritual genius, so I should just do what he says. Because if I don't, then uh, I won't make spiritual advancement very well, very quickly. And so feeling like my life is dependent on his instruction, I follow the instructions, even if I don't like them, or sometimes don't totally understand them. But Prabhupada said, do it, so okay, uh, I don't understand it exactly, or I don't feel like it, but I should do it, because it's the right thing, and that gives me strength. And so really, really, that's what was the force behind Prabhupada. It was the instruction. It was the fidelity to the instruction. And you may know that Prabhupada said, um, there's a verse in Bhagavad Gita, Bhyavisatvika Bhuti, Ekeha Kurunandana, that means that devotee is fixed, this, he's focused, one, one mind, resolute determination. Bhyavisatvika Bhuti, Eke, Eke means one, resolute determination, fixed. And so Prabhupada read a purport by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, and in that purport he said, Basically, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur said the disciple takes the instruction of the spiritual master as his life and soul. And Prabhupada said that was the biggest motivation to finally come to America. You, you know, sometimes we know we should do something and we're waiting for the perfect time to do it. And, and as you know, there's never a perfect time. So it seems from what Prabhupada was saying, it was like, you know, he's preparing and thinking, and when should I go? Should I go? How will I go? And when he read that purport, it was like, okay, that <laughs> let's pack our bags, you know, let's get let's get there. That was really a transitioning point. So it really it really shows how much that resonated with Prabhupada because he had that mood that my guru's order is everything. If he didn't have that mood, he wouldn't have come. He would he would have been like his other god brothers. They just would have stayed and thought, someone will do it, or no one will do it, or it's not possible, or, you know, we tried and didn't work. Let's just stay in India. And possible also, you know, to stay in Vrindavan and just be blissful. And one of, one of the most amazing things about Vrindavan that Prabhupada said was that I wish I hadn't spent so much time there. because. Because normally you think someone would say, you know, I didn't discover Vrindavan until I'd been a devotee for 20 years. I, I wish I, you know, and then I've only spent, you know, three Kartiks, the Kartiks. I wish I would have spent more time there. And Prabhupada's saying, I wish I would have spent less time. What did he mean? He, you know, he was experiencing the bliss of Krishna consciousness. He meant I should be out giving it. So it's not about me and my bliss, you know. You have eternity to experience bliss, you know, if you're like into relishing, you know, if you're a Rasik Vaishnava and you just want to relish, you know, you'll have eternity to do that. But while you're here, there's all these conditioned souls that need your help. So that that prompted Prabhupada to say something like that, like don't, don't shy away from the cities. Don't, you know, of course we need sadhana, we need to relish, of course, all those things. But in relation, within a preaching context where whatever we strength we get get for ourselves we share we give we build our strength so we can give it so he said that i wasted his actual words were i wasted so much time in vrindavan so that means i should have been out there um, and sometimes when sometimes Prabhupada would reminisce about his struggles in preparing to come to America and, and his whole life basically being a preparation and and the maintenance of his family, uh, how that had to take precedence to the order of his guru, but still trying to serve the order of his guru. And then 1959, renouncing. Um, and then Prabhupada said, better late than never. And 
he also said, you know, I should have done, I should have done it when he told me, but I was married, I couldn't. I wasted so much time. You know, he uses that I wasted so much time. But one thing we see about pure devotees is they don't need a lot of time. Like Lord Jesus, how how many years did he preach? Was it like what three years or something? Short. So um, three years, yeah. And Prabhupada's was 12 and maybe, you know, you could say more specifically, more like 11, 10 or 11. And we've never been able to duplicate, duplicate what Prabhupada did, you know, now with his 5,000 disciples. <clears throat> of course, we've expanded. But if you actually look at ISKCON and night when Prabhupada left, there's a lot that it's never been duplicated. One moon. So, you know, Prabhupada said, I wasted time. But he also said, you, I had to be ready. I had to prepare. And we know it's all divine arrangement because Americans weren't ready for Prabhupada. And that's what's, that's what's such a big faith builder for us, um, especially for me, because I, I was 15 when Prabhupada landed. And, you know, when you're 15, your brain starts to think about, well, you know, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? At least if you have a brain that works, then it starts, you know, if you have a brain that works around 14, 15, 16, it starts to click in, especially if you've taken a lot of LSD and marijuana, it really clicks in. Yeah, you really start thinking. So that was my generation. But having grown in that generation and having seen the transition America went through from the early 60s to the mid and late 60s, if you had to pick the perfect time, I mean, seriously, if you had to choose, like you're a business person who could see the future, forecast the future, you would choose September 1965, basically. That's when you would choose, you know, sometime, maybe summer or fall 65. You wouldn't choose 64, it wouldn't have worked. Um, and if you came 66, you lost a year. So 65 was when the transition happened. Then by 67, it was totally in full swing, um, as I remember, 67, 68. Um, everyone and their brother and sister and, uh, was a hippie by then. It, it, you know, unless they lived in Texas, then, you know, they just remained hicks forever. You know? But um, unless they were in Austin, yeah. If they were in Austin, they were okay. Yeah. So, um, no, but there were some hippie farms in the Midwest, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's that's detail, historic details. So, so for me personally, having seen and experienced that transition with my own eyes, like I was in Haight Ashbury in 1965, I saw, oh my God. I didn't even know what was happening because I was from Los Angeles and it hadn't started there. And I went with a friend to visit his sister in Haight-Ashbury and I saw this hippie thing. And I was just like, oh my God, what's going on here? Like major transition. And so, you know, September 65, like, okay, there is a God and he is in control of this show here. Yeah, definitely, because this, this wouldn't have happened, couldn't have happened better any other way. <laughs> Hippie. Oh, they had hippies in Ohio, yeah. Cowgirl hippies, yeah. Different breed of hippies, right? Imitation hippies, wannabe hippies, or yeah. It's either New York or San Francisco. If you're well, not there, you're like wannabes, right? Kind of. So, and I went to school in Berkeley, which was near San Francisco. So I was, um, and then I spent time in San Francisco in 1967. And that was the height, the height, summer of love and the whole, you know, so I saw it all. And I missed Prabhupada by a week. When he left, I didn't know that until I read Lila Amrita. I arrived a week after Prabhupada. So, but so I was there in Haight-Ashbury where he was. So it's now a Tirtha. I went to Golden Gate Park. It was a Tirtha. I didn't perform Tirtha activities in Golden Gate Park, but it had become a Tirtha so association. 
so um so there was this whole population of people who were like almost like waiting for Prabhupada, somebody like Prabhupada to arrive, and then he arrives. So, so to me, from my vantage point, uh, I see this as a transcendental pastime. But I, I, as transcendental as it is, and how it unfolded, we should never lose sight of the fact that it took a, a depth of faith in the order of Guru that is perhaps unprecedented in, at least in our lifetime, to do that, to, to use it because, because nobody did it. He was the only one. No one had that faith. And so let's read, and then you'll see how that, um, as we read it, you'll see the reflection of this faith. So it was written in Bengali. I'll read in Bengali because I was a Bengali. Well, I was supposedly a Rissan in my last life. The language is close. Maybe the life before Bengal. Arisa is next to Bengal. Bhora Kripa Kwaile Krishna Adhamya Prati. Ki lagi yani le hita koro emi gati. My dear Lord Krishna, you are so kind upon this useless soul. But I do not know why you have brought me here. Now you can do whatever you like with me. So that's that shows Prabhupada's, I don't want to say confusion, but I think we can say, um, I don't know why you brought me here is, is, is also another way of saying, I don't know if anything's going to happen. And it's another way of saying, according to my vision, these Americans will not take this up. You know, this is the most materialistic country in the world. And he later says, yeah, you must have a reason. You know, he's kind of like, it's like, it's like, okay, I don't know why you're here. I guess we'll find out. I'm ready, you know, pull the strings, you know, whatever you want to do. Let, let's see what happens. That's, that's Prabhupada's mood from, I have no idea how it's going to unfold, but I'm ready to be your instrument. So that's also, of course, the consciousness of the pure devotee so one of the thing one of the things we learn here is that Prabhupada was not evaluating success or failure by his own calculations but he was open to what krishna could do and it seemed you know like you've brought me here like i'm here there must be some reason you know like why you know you know I get on the plane to go to London and it ends up in Germany. It's like, okay, Krishna, you know, I guess you want me in Germany. You know, there must be some reason, you know, if that's what you want. Okay. But something like that, like here I am. So let's see what's happening. That was the mood. So, um, and most people are very, uh, have, a, have a difficult time with not knowing what's going on, not knowing the future, isn't it? Not being in a stable situation. So Prabhupada is saying, just it's basically saying, I have no idea what's going to happen. There's no stability here. I don't know if I'm going to live. I don't know if anybody's going to come. You know, I just don't know anything. But I'm willing, I'm willing to try because you've brought me here. So it's 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 a, it's a mood in which Prabhupada not only lived himself, but he appreciated that we should have that mood also, uh, as far as as we can manifest it. Now we're all in different situations in life. Some of you are married with children. Some of you are working. Um, we can't just drop everything. But so the idea is that, that how can we imbibe that mood relative to our situation you know that yeah it's it's kind of like in common common terminology Prabhupada saying you know i'm willing to go out of my comfort zone uh, or i definitely will have to go i'm already out of my comfort zone i'm in america now and i'm definitely willing to be out of it if it's to serve you and it, and it shows that that he's not concerned about his comfort his security his sense gratification, whatever. Just if this is what you want, then let's do it. 
And it also shows that that's how you succeed as a, as a missionary. It has to be about other people, it has to be about the mission, it has to be about service. When it becomes about us, well, then we spoil everything. How do I feel? What credit am I? What credit do I get? What, <clears throat> what gratification do I get? What are my benefits? It doesn't work. Then you're not empowered. So Prabhupada was empowered because we can see why he was empowered, right? And we can see that the qualifications that Prabhupada had, anyone who was going to be successful in, in spreading Krishna consciousness would have to have these qualifications. I think we can see it wouldn't work otherwise. Right? Going into that dense, dark jungle by yourself. And then we saw that Prabhupada tolerated so much because his mood was, well, Krishna, I'm willing, I'm willing to try this. So willing to try it means I have to tolerate whatever I have to go through, correct? Isn't it? Otherwise, I'm not going to do it. So um, we can pick up on these things, try to imbibe these, this mood. But one thing uh, was that we as Prabhupada disciples had the great fortune to imbibe this by, by osmosis through his association because all of this was right in front of us. And we all know how inspiring it is when we see another pure devotee engaged in pure devotional service. And so the whole movement had the spotlight on Prabhupada. So we were always aware of this level of surrender. So it was kind of like our benchmark. This is, this is what we're supposed to shoot for. And that's why the movement was so powerful and it moved so quickly and devotees were so surrendered because Prabhupada, we were just trying to follow in his footsteps as best we could. And so look at these footsteps, you know, this is like, this is like, you know, we talk about the gopis, you know, as the greatest devotees most surrendered. This is, you know, this is what it looks like in the modern world in practical terms. You know, you, you give up your home, you give up your husband, you give up your children. Krishna's playing his flute, he's calling you into the forest the dead of night. That's what Prabhupada did, right? Gave up his children, home, wife, everything. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta was calling. Krishna was calling through Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. And he came in the dead of night into this dark jungle called New York City. So it's the same thing. So it's nice to put it in that context, isn't it? Because, you know, when you hear about the gopis, it's like, okay, but I'm not a gopi and I'm not liberated. All right, so we understand. We can understand surrender from the gopis, of course. We're supposed to. But if we translate it into Prabhupada's actions, then it's, I think it's more relevant. <clears throat> okay, let's read the next verse. Ache kinchu karjo karj tobe toba e anomane nahi kena aniben e ugra stane. Yeah, so, yeah, the next verse is just an extension of the first, but I guess you have some business here, otherwise, why would you bring me to this terrible place? So I think we discussed that. <laughs> you must want me here for some reason, because otherwise I wouldn't be here. You know, I wouldn't have got that ticket, I wouldn't have had the desire, I wouldn't have got the sponsorship in Butler, Pencil, you know, looks like you want me here. Okay, next verse. Rajas tamo gunera era, subhai achon. Vasudev kotaruchi nahi se pushana. Most of the population here is covered by the material modes of ignorance and passion. Absorbed in material life, they think themselves very happy and satisfied, and therefore, they have no taste for the transcendental message of Sudeva. I do not know how they will be able to understand it. So now we're getting a glimpse into Prabhupada's mind. As I said, this is kind of like, you know, this is kind of like um, if all of us were going to produce a movie on Prabhupada, we would be discussing this just right under, you know, what's this character? You know, so let's say one of you is going to play Prabhupada. And so you're going to have to totally, you know, 
imbibe his mood. So we're trying to understand that, right? So, um, so here we see where Prabhupada is saying, um, it's like he's saying, I'm looking out the window at this materialistic population, and I, I don't understand how these people could understand the Bhagavatam. It's like, how was that possible? So before he's, he's saying, you sent me here, you must have a plan. But when I look at, from my vantage point, I don't understand what the plan is because materially speaking, it doesn't look like this is gonna work. Let me just hit the magic button on my router and see if it does magic. Hold on one second. I think it often does nothing, but it makes me feel like at least I tried. I feel good that I tried to get it to work. Okay, well, let's see if it does something. So, um, you know, sometimes you get an order to do a service and in your mind, like this is not gonna work or it's impossible. And your spiritual master, your authorities are very, very determined. No, you should do this. You know, we have to do this. How do we do it? I can't figure it out. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it's going to work. That's kind of Prabhupada's mood. You know, it, it's two moods going on simultaneously. There's, there must be some plan behind this. I just don't understand how it's going to work. You ever felt like that? You know, I'm supposed to do this, but I don't understand. So there's this, but as we said, there's this faith. And the faith is, I actually don't need to understand how it's going to work. It's kind of like just, I'm just revealing, this is how I feel. But that doesn't really matter whether I understand or not. I have faith in your order. Let's see what happens. So, you know, it's kind of like overriding my perception, my feeling, and then going with the feeling of my guru. Well, this is what he feels, right? Because if we just go on what we feel, we won't be successful unless, unless our feelings are Krishna conscious, unless we're very advanced, but sometimes they're not. So if we go with our feelings, if, they're, if our feelings are covered by the modes of nature, then we're not gonna be successful. And a lot of times we saw that with Prabhupada, where if someone doubted something Prabhupada said, or he said to do something, but they didn't do it because they thought it, was, um, it would be a mistake to do it or a bad choice, bad decision. And on rare occasions, it worked out better. They they made they actually made the right choice. Uh, uh, but in most cases, especially if it's something that's directly spiritual, then they would get chastised by Prabhupada. Why did you do that? I told you not to do that. And then they would explain why, and then Prabhupada would explain that's your material thinking. But in rare situations, it's just like, well, Prabhupada, the laws of the country are like this. We can't do it. Oh, okay. He Prabhupada didn't know. So that's using intelligence. But when it's something which requires the intelligence, the spiritual intelligence of a pure devotee to understand, then that separates the men from the boys or the men from the mice, I think. It's a better example, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So sometimes we're just going to have to, as we stay in America, bite the bullet. We get an order from a guru, and it's and it's just like, how is this going to work? And so, but Guru Marsh wants it, so we're gonna we have to make it happen. I don't know how it's going to work. And then we've heard of many, many stories of miracles happening to, to make things happen. You hear these stories all the time. Um, I just told us, I think I told the story a few weeks ago that devotees were getting an eco village. Not it's kind of devotees, the devotees in Rhyme Rush, they're getting an eco village and um, they raised some money and they were short 250,000. And someone had inherited some money and they wanted to give a donation to somebody. And through a friend or acquaintance, this and that, they ended up giving it to the devotees and it was 250,000. So, you know, again, 
we see Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God, in case you were doubting. You know, we, we, and so there, there, are many, there are many times we see this, just to, and Krishna is saying, okay, so, you know, you were doubting me, right? Okay, so I have to make it clear that I'm still here in my full glory, just so you don't forget. So that, that's kind of the mood of Prabhupada. I, I know you're the miracle maker. I just don't understand how this is going to work. It just doesn't, you know. But, but it's like, uh, I would say Prabhupada's mood is more like, I'm waiting to be surprised because from my vision, it's not going to happen. But he's not saying I'm not going to do anything. More like he's saying, like, I know it's going to happen. I just can't see how. But I know you'll do it. You know, that I do. So that's a good, that's a good mood to enter a service, which is difficult. I don't know how this is going to happen, but I know it will. So with that confidence, um, you, you can go on enthusiastically, because if you don't know how it's going to go and you think it's not going to go, it's hard to be enthusiastic all the time, right? And so, you know, we have, we have seen that Prabhupada was enthusiastic, even he's saying, I don't know how, but it doesn't mean he wasn't going to be enthusiastic, right? Okay, so we'll read the next one. Hmm. Hmm. Next verse is similar. Tabe jari tabe kapa hoi hoi tuki shakari sambhava hoi tuni se koi tuki. But I know your causeless mercy can make everything possible because you are the most expert mystic. I, I, yeah. So it's basically saying what I said. I don't know how it's going to happen, but you can do it. So let's go. I'm ready. Next verse. Ki bhave bujhale thara bhuje se das ita kripa koro prabhu kori nija bash bash how will they understand the mellows of devotional service? <clears throat> oh Lord, I'm simply praying for your mercy so that I will be able to convince them about your message. So now this, this theme is continuing, but now it's going into it's going from somehow it's going to happen, I don't know, to if I'm going to be the instrument, then to make it happen, then I need your mercy because I'm my own. This is like. This is too much weight to pick up, you know, I need help. So um, this, this idea, by your mercy, anything's possible. That's a, a theme throughout our scripture, right? By your mercy, a blind man sees stars in the sky, a lame man crosses mountains, and a dumb man speaks poetry. Right? So that... Um, That faith is it's 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 powerful and I would say necessary because in a sense, I often think when I look at the job of spreading Krishna consciousness, there's just a certain part of me that says this is impossible. People are too conditioned, and it's like the dog tail example we gave I think on Friday or last Wednesday. We're trying to help people become Krishna conscious. We're trying to you know get out hair straightening gel on their dog tail. But you know, sometimes it lasts for a few hours and then the tail just goes, isn't it? If you gotta put more goop on it, and you know how much goop do you have to put on it before it stays? And, and we get frustrated with ourselves, we can get frustrated with others. So I'm gonna need mercy if I'm gonna, you know, get to the heart of people and convince them to give their lives to Krishna. I will need your mercy. I can't do it. So this is really, you know, when, as we go through the prayer, you can really see it's leading up to this, you know, uh, here are all the conditions. They're impossible. Uh, you know, I know you can do it, but you're asking me to do it. So if you want me to do it, I will need your mercy to be able to do it because on my own, I can't. So this is how we, we enter devotional service. This is our mood. And so, when you when you have this mood and then subsequently have experience of being successful at doing things that you didn't think you could succeed at 
or that were just difficult kind of builds up a muscle where this becomes like your normal way of thinking. Okay, we're going to do this. How? I don't know. We did the last one. We did the last 20. We didn't know how. We didn't know who was going to do it, where the money was coming from, where the land was coming from, but it happened. So, you, you know, you build up faith. So then the, these, these difficult things just become normal duties. You know, everything we do is impossible, you know, which is, in a sense, kind of the definition of spreading Krishna consciousness. It's, it's kind of doing, at least in my world, it's really, you know, just amazing that people become devotees and so many things happen. And, you know, it's like, let's go, let's go to prison and speak the glories of the government, the glories of lawyers and judges and police. Let's, let's go and glorify the police. You know, how will that go over in prison, you know? So that's kind of like what we're doing, you know, we're glorifying the policemen. <laughs> like, huh? And, but somehow or other, we're convincing prisoners to, you know, that the police are great. <laughs> so, you know, it's like Prabhupada saying, how do you do that? I don't know. You're going to have to help me. Okay, next verse. Tomara ichai, tomar ichai shobai, hoi moyabash. Tomara ichai anasha. Maya Parash, Parash. All living entities have come under the control of the illusory energy by your will. And therefore, if you like, by your will, they can also be released from the clutches. So it's kind of, you know, one way of looking at this is it's like Krishna's kind of speaking logically to Krishna, you know, like, I need your help. After all, you put him in a Maya, you can get him out of Maya, right? So it's like, it's kind of like, Krishna, don't forget, you can help me do this. You know, if you got him in Maya, you can get him out of Maya. Just reminding you. you know. So, um, but it's also a prayer. It's also a prayer we can have. Oh, Krishna, you know, uh, I want to get out of Maya. You put me in, you, can, you know, I somehow or other, you know, created Maya, you can cover her also. You can put the curtain over Maya or the curtain over Krishna. So you can put it over Maya for me. Right? Hare Krishna. Why are we having so many problems? Too many kids playing video games. That's the problem. Yeah. You know, this is, I have it directly plugged in, plugged in, Ethernet, you know. But, we're just getting a direct connect, a more direct connection to a slow connection. So we have, we're better connected to a slow connection. Taba icha hoy jadi tadera udha bhujhave nishchai tobe kota she tomar. I wish that you may deliver them. Therefore, if you so desire their deliverance, then only will they be able to understand your message. So now, Prabhupada is adding to, you can remove illusion to, this is what I want you to do. <laughs> but he's saying, if you really want them to be delivered, um, then you can, deliver them you can you know i can speak and you can get them to understand so now Prabhupada quotes several verses from bhagavatam about the importance of hearing and chanting because now he's talking about the power of hearing and the power of words so i'm going to after he quotes them i'm going to read the next verse because it'll make sense um, and these these verses just talk about how hearing liberates one from the modes of passion and ignorance. So, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of like Prabhupada saying, you know, well, you can deliver them. You can make, um, hearing is such a powerful process. And he quotes all the verses to show how it's a powerful process and how Krishna helps the devotee from within. And if he, 
he hears, he over, helps him overcome passion and ignorance, then the devotees in goodness, and he becomes enlivened and liberated and peaceful and detached. So then the next verse, Rajas tamo hote tobe paibe nishta vidaya obhadra shate shate kuchi be tahor. He will become liberated from the influence of the modes of ignorance and passion, and thus all auspicious things accumulated in the core of the heart will disappear. So he's just restating what those verses are stating that this is what will happen if they hear. So it's kind of like saying, if you help them, then this can, you know, the Bhagavatam's power, if you can make it possible for them to understand the power of the Bhagavatam will, will do the job. How will I make them understand this message of Krishna consciousness? I'm very unfortunate, unqualified, and the most fallen. Therefore, I am seeking your benediction so that I can convince them, for I am powerless to do so on my own. So he's, Prabhupada's reiterating the same, he's going deeper with the same <clears throat> message, but now he's saying that I lack qualification. You have to do everything, I'm powerless. So he's just making this entreaty deeper. And he already said it, it's just like that. I have to emphasize this. I, I am dependent. I need your help. It's not going to happen on my own. You have the power. You, um, if you give me the power, then we can do it. Atache enecho prabhu kata bhali bhari. Jetamari cha prabhu kore e bhari. Somehow or other. Oh Lord, you have brought me here to speak about you. Now, my Lord, it is up to you to make me a success or failure as you're like. So I'm willing to do this, Seva. You can make it happen. Uh, success or failure, I'm, I'm here, I'm your servant. And if you wanted to succeed on my own, my own power is insufficient, but with your power can happen. If you so desire that, then make me a success. If not, make me a failure. I'm here, I'm at your service. Akila Jagad Guru Bachana Se Amar Alankrite Koribar Kamata Tomar, O spiritual master of all the worlds. I can simply repeat your message. So if you like, you can make my power of speaking suitable for their understanding. In other words, you can, as Ramananda Roy said, you can, uh, my tongue is like a string instrument and you are playing the string, so words are coming out of my mouth, but they're actually your words. So that's the Muda Prabhupada saying. Um, you can give me the right words so that they will understand my message. So he's saying both. You can help them understand it, and then you can give me the words that would uh, be the right words for them to understand. So you can make my speaking suitable for their understanding. You know, but that's a. It's also, you know, if you ever speak in public, this is a beautiful mood. Krishna, please help. Give me the right words to touch the heart of these people, and please help these people. Please help these people understand my words. Yeah, you know, it's it's like it's like perfect, perfect mood to enter before you you give class. Could even memorize these verses. You know, we chant Mangalacharana before class. These would be nice verses to chant now that I'm reading them. Isn't it? It is. <clears throat> now, Prabhupada's kind of, you know, saying, you know, like, well, whatever I've asked for, if you make this happen, it's going to be amazing. Taba Kripa Hoile Mor Kata Shuddha Hobe. Shuniya shabhara shoka dhukha je kuchibe. Only by your causeless mercy will my words be 
become pure. I am sure that when this transcendental message penetrates their hearts, they will certainly feel gladdened and thus become liberated from all unhappy conditions of life. In other words, Krishna, if you can make my words suitable, if you can make them in a suitable position, then it's going to happen. Like for sure, it's going to, you know, even the Americans, for sure, they're going to get it. If we can just get this message into their heart, it's going to be amazing. Aniyacho jadi prabhu amare na cha te na chao na chao prabhu na chao se mate kashtera putali chata na chao se mate. Na chao means dance. Oh Lord, I believe it means dance. Oh Lord, I'm just like a puppet in your hands. So if you have brought me here to dance, then make me dance, make me dance. Oh Lord, make me dance as you like. So for, for a devotee to do what Prabhupada did, to do the impossible, what was never done before, they have to have this mood of being a puppet. Because as Prabhupada's saying, it's Krishna who has to do this. It's, this, is not, this is not the work of an ordinary person. It's the work of Krishna. And so Krishna has to empower me. So we call that shak, Shaktavesh avatar. So you can be empowered by the Shakti. So basically, that's what Prabhupada's saying. I need the empowerment of the Shakti of Krishna. And um, if you empower me, I will have no resistance. You, you know how we have so much resistance. Prabhu, can you do this? Yeah, but I can't do it till tomorrow at three o'clock, and I can only do it for a half hour. And I, I need prasadam if you're going to ask me to do it, and you know, make sure the air conditioning is on in the kitchen if I'm going to go in, and if there can't be any oil on the floor because I don't want to slip on you know, like highly conditioned devotional service. And so that person is not the right person to send to America in 1965. Okay, I'll go, but you know, Upper East Side in New York, penthouse, need my own driver and car. I need a salary, you know, 5,000 a week. And yeah, yeah, right? That's, you know, that's not the person we're going to choose. So one who is willing to dance according to the will of Krishna, that person can become empowered, fully empowered, with sufficient power to spread Krishna consciousness. That, that's the requirement. Uh, there. There can't be any resistance to surrender, and there can't be any ulterior motives, ulterior motives. There has to only be that this person is my agent in New York. He will do whatever I ask. And so I can empower him because there's no resistance. You know, when I turn the wheel left, he will go left. If a if a person is not on that level, Krishna will try to turn the wheel left and he may resist and not turn the wheel. So then he can't fully do Krishna's work. So anyone who is an empowered incarnation is only empowered because they will give the steering wheel to Krishna. The steering wheel of their life has been turned over to Krishna. So that's Prabhupada's position. And in my mind, that's one of the most glorious aspects of Prabhupada. And his, his being and the being of his guru, the being of Mahaprabhu, the being of Lord Krishna is the same. There was no, there's no distinction between what they wanted and what he wanted. And so that's the ideal example of the disciple. We have so many desires, things we like, things we don't like. Ideal disciple is, the ideal disciple is, what is my Guru Maharaj like? That's what I should like. I should like what he likes. Of course, you know. I'm. Um, he may like, you know, goat's milk, and you don't like goat's milk. So we're not talking about that. But in terms of mission, in terms of that vision and his desire for spreading Krishna consciousness, that the more we become one with that, the more we become empowered. Lochetanya is looking for people who are willing to spread his mission. For me, for you, for anybody. 
And so whoever can be in the puppet mood, then he'll pick, oh, there's a there's a good puppet. Oh, that other one, no, forget. I, I pick up his arm and he, he pulls it down. I, I can't, what kind of puppet is that? You know, he's going, you know, I pull his leg up, he pushes his leg down. Have you ever felt like that? Yeah, so if you want to be effective in spreading Krishna consciousness, the, the more you're a conduit for the desire of Srila Prabhupada, the more he will use you. And Krishna will see, Mahaprabhu will see, okay, here's someone I can use. Let's make more arrangements for this devotee or whatever project they're working on. Okay. Bhakti nai bheda nai namne kubodhar dhor. Bhakti bhedanta nam ebe shartakor. I have no devotion, nor do I have any knowledge, but I have a strong faith in the holy name of Krishna. I've been designated as Bhakti Vedanta, and now, if you like, you can fulfill the real purport of Bhakti Vedanta. Yeah, so the goal of knowledge is Bhakti. So, what's the purport of Bhakti Vedanta? That <laughs> We spread Krishna consciousness in the West. That will be the purport. Um, now Prabhupada says, I have strong faith in the name of Krishna. So, you know, you can look at that in two ways. You know, for himself, I have strong faith in the name of Krishna as my inspiration. But I think, I think also, maybe more importantly, that I have strength, I have faith in the power of the holy name. And as Prabhupada expressed, I have strength in the, uh, in the power of purify, purifying power of Srimad Bhagavatam. If they just get it in their heart, they'll be purified. If they get the holy name in their heart, they'll be purified. And we, we can see, if you study Prabhupada's preaching, you can really see that this faith that he had in the holy name, it really, really shines through in his preaching, if you look for it. You know, how many times have we said that Prabhupada said 16 rounds? Four principles, you go back to Godhead. And that, that comes up in so many different contexts. We've heard him say it in so many different situations. That's, that's faith in the holy name, the power of the holy name. And as I've said many, many, many times, obviously, if Prabhupada didn't have that faith in the holy name, he wouldn't have come to America to even try it. You know, it's like you don't, if you don't have the right tools, you can't do the job. So he understood this is the right tool. Now, someone else may look at that tool and say, I don't think this tool can do the job. But that person would not have the same faith that Prabhupada had. And Prabhupada's looking at the tool and saying, no, this, this tool can clean anything. Can, this tool can clean anybody in any country. And when Prabhupada started preaching, then he was you know, when he's had, when he was making disciples who he felt were capable, he would send them, go to Europe, go to Africa, go to South America, go, you know, go everywhere. And wherever they wanted to go, Prabhupada was very enthusiastic. And he never said, oh, don't go there, those people are useless. He never said that. Sometimes we say that, you know, those people, yeah. But Prabhupada never said it. It was always the holy name is powerful. And it was also, well, maybe not in this life, they'll become devotees or pure devotees, but in another life, give them the holy name, another life, give them a chance. So Prabhupada definitely had great faith in the holy name. And we also need to have that faith. Otherwise, you know, we may not be able to be enthusiastic to give Krishna consciousness if we don't have faith that the process we're giving actually works. So we'll stop here, and then I'm going to go look at the chat and tolerate the, the Google chat, which is hard to scroll through. So Pi says, I hope your name's Pi, because I forgot if it was P or Pi. I thought you said Pi. If your name's Pi, I get hungry every time I say your name. I just never stop feeling amazed when I look at what he did for us. 
and how much he managed to do in service of Krishna in just a few years. He started with no material security at all, but it had the most important thing on earth, faith. And devotion, I will always feel inspired about the fantastic things he did because of Krishna's blessing and a pure mind. Just like I was saying in the beginning, you know, these examples of pure devotion are extremely important for us because normally, you know, the, the biggest example of devotion we have, the one we're most connected with is our own because we live with it, right? And so we need better examples than our own, don't we? And, you know, and we are all, you know, we're all raised in a very similar ways. So for most of us, our devotion is kind of in the same ballpark. You know, some of us are better, some of us are worse, but it's it's more or less similar. And then someone like Prabhupada comes and be like, oh, this is what devotion is. You know, this I didn't realize, I didn't realize that oh, this is what faith is. Yeah. So that's why that's why Prabhupada Leela is so important for us because it's our benchmark. This is what we're shooting for, or at least. At least we can understand this is what pure bhakti is. So we just found out about Sydney's mother, a hippie from Ohio. Ohio is cool. Columbus is cool. Texas, Austin. Outside of that, I don't know. I don't know if I can talk to them. You know, it, it's so funny. It's so funny because America has, you know, it's 50 states and so many states are different. And so if you're like someone like me from Los Angeles or you're from New York, the tendency to think you're better than everybody. Isn't it, Sydney, that we think we're better? We joke on Texas, you guys speak, you guys wear shoes out there or what? You, know, you speak English? You know, so. Uh, as we as we've spoken, we've often spoke. You know, wherever there's an opportunity to puff oneself up, they will, even if it's based on a total illusion, <laughs> isn't it? I met this girl in Texas. She was helping me in my business when I was there, and then she moved to New York to study. And she said everybody made fun of her because the way she, because the way she talked like that, they all they all thought she was stupid because stupid people talk like that. Right? She had such a hard time doing this. Anyway, we love your parents. We love all hippies. The real hippies became devotees. Manarada says, Prabhupada's mood, Prabhupada seems to show a gopi's mood when trying to praise Krishna. Yeah, exactly. You said it before I did. Congratulations. Pai says, if I might ask a question, does passion have to be a bad thing in itself? Can it be a good thing if we turn it into passion for living for Krishna? Yeah, as long as it's not the mode of passion as Krishna describes in the Gita, Tamaguna. You know, like when we, we say the mode of passion, that's different, that uh, may be distinguished from passion in some cases. It depends how you're defining passion. I, um, if you're defining passion, which I think you are, as, as an enthusiasm for doing something, yeah, that's good. If you're defining it as motive passion, it means you're doing it for yourself. So we want to do things passionately with enthusiasm and in and very, just very. I'm very into. I'm passionate about. Kirtan. Yeah, that's good. Go out and do Kirtan everywhere. That's great. But if you say, I'm in the mode of passion about Kirtan, that would mean maybe you're compromising. You're going out on Harinam at 530 in the morning and not chanting any rounds. Or you're doing it to be just because you like music and that's the only reason. Or you're doing it because you want to get some honor. That would be the mode of passion. So that clarifies that. Um, oh, you got a handicap van donated? Like, as soon as you thought about it? Wow. Can you think about $300 million? Because I want to open up one eco-village on every continent. 
and read about. Yeah, well, and then, and then I want to start my business at e Eco Village. So yeah, so we need maybe 40, 40 million for each one. Just a rough estimate. Who knows? I had this 300 million in my mind and I, I was chanting the other day. Instead of meditating, you know how sometimes I say everybody meditates on 16? Why don't we get my 16 done? I was meditating on 300 million. So I had this vision, I was in China, you know, I was doing some program with these businessmen and each one was coming to me to offer a million dollars and there were 300 of them. As I was trying to think, how, was, how would that ever happen? I, go, I, can, I impressed 300 businessmen and they all came up and wrote me a check for a million dollars. Unless you know 300 businessmen who want to get rid of a million each or one that wants to get rid of 300, that would be nice. Okay. Um, anyway, I just, I can't stop thinking like that. I don't know why, but really, I've, every day that I hear about how bad the material world is, I get more inspired to create an eco village. Um, just today, I was hearing about an Ayurvedic doctor, devotee, speaking about how bad the food is and how. They have this pest, this horrible pesticide that they use on wheat, but often pe peanuts grow where wheat grows. And this pesticide is like, if you wanted, it's, it's the way he described it was like, if you wanted to get sick, this pesticide is probably the best thing you could digest. You know, you just want to like totally screw your liver up and your metabolism and your glucose levels. And this pesticide is like, number one to do that. And it's all over the peanuts because it's it's sprayed on the wheat. Okay, what to speak of the wheat. And his conclusion was, you know, the more I study about how food is grown and how, because I, because he knows medically how it's affecting us, the more I understand Prabhupada's grow your own food statement. Don't depend on, you know, because, you know, these farms are like factories. And then he was also saying something which I think we all subconsciously realize. He was saying, you know how when your mother cooks a meal, you know how it's like it's home cooked, you know, mama's cooking, right? They probably have, you probably have a hundred restaurants in Texas, right? Yeah. Mama's cooking, right? Isn't it? Because everyone loves mama's cooking, isn't it? Because like nobody cooks like mama because mama cooks with love and makes everything perfect. And, and even if it's not perfect, you feel the love. So he was saying something, and I have experience of this because I've lived on farms. He was saying, the food that you grow is like mama's cooking. It's grown with, you know, you're growing it. It's your baby, you know, and you're growing it for Krishna. And so it's, it's a different experience eating that food. It's grown with love, as opposed to what he called factory farms. And I was thinking of all those I don't know in your country, but in America, we often get tomatoes that are like, basically they're kind of like red pieces of cardboard with water on them, isn't it? You know those, you know, well, if you go to a cheap grocery store, you'll get those, you know, it's like, like, what is this thing, you know? And it was like, it's almost like it was made in a factory, you know, factory farm. So those farms are, you know, have like, has like one, has the only nutrient in the soil that's in the soil is the nutrient that you need to get this thing to look like a tomato. Otherwise, for all intents and purposes, it's not really a tomato. And I'm sure, you know, I, I don't like to study a lot about health because then I start to realize that practically everything I'm eating is bad for me. So, I, you know, I kind of refrain from it. You know, I'm careful about what I eat, you know. Did you ever, you ever, you ever like the new health food, this and that, and you eat it, and then you know, three years later, they go, this is, this is killing everybody. You know, it's got too much of this and that in it, isn't it? So it's like, welcome to Kali Yuga, everyone. It's in full swing. You arrive, you arrive late, it's in full swing. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know why I got off on that tangent. Oh yeah, 300, one eco village, more than one. Like a one in every city, actually. That's what Prabhupada wanted. 
Um, and all the food we grow is what the devotees eat and what we cook in our restaurants. All right, the budget has just gone up since we need one eco village in every city. And there's like 700 temples, we need 700 eco villages. Okay, now we're in the billions. I think I need 300 billion instead. All right, shoot for the moon. You'll land in the stars. Okay. Kishore Mani says, when we appreciate Braj and want to stay there, then we add, then we add to understand, have to understand Srila Prabhupada's mood through our spiritual teachers. We can come back and share with others in a loving. Yeah, exactly. He wants us to share Braj with the world. Pai says. Uh, it's a wonderful reminder for us. If a pure devotee like Srila Prabhupada is still totally dependent on Krishna's mercy, how dependent aren't we? Or how dependent we must be. I need to remind myself every day that I can't do anything on my own. My ego is often there trying to convince me about the opposite. Yeah, well, it's the job of the ego. Wanting to be good through my own power. How to silence the wannabe good girl ego to become even more dependent on Krishna? Well, you probably already know the answer, but if you want me to answer it, I can say something. Um, you know, when asked these questions, I always ask the question back, why, <laughs> why, why do you need to give fertilizer to your ego? Like, what's the reason? You know, like, why, why do you need it to, 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 pump up the ego to feel good. And, and the unfortunate answer is because we came here to be God, so it feels good to be God. And being humble is, is pretty much the opposite of being God. It's total dependence on him. And so humility is not something like we're that comfortable with because we haven't practiced it that much in the last billion and a half lifetimes, have we? We've pretty much practiced being God and now so, you know, it takes time to, you know, slow down, unwind. We're unwinding the ego. But I think it's a question also we can all ask ourselves, like, why, why do I need this gratification? Like, what is, what is missing? And of course, the easy answer is, well, if I had love of Krishna, I wouldn't need it, because that would gratify me, my real ego, right? So generally, we would answer from the spiritual perspective that if you're full in Krishna consciousness, then you don't need ego gratification or any, and, and really any kind of deep sensual gratification. And the ego is the deepest, the most intense. But even psychologically speaking, if you're full psychologically and healthy psychologically and healthy and have a healthy sense of yourself, then you don't need that ego gratification. It's when we don't have that, then we need it. It's kind of like a drug. I think uh, his connection is really low, low, so we can just wait a little bit. It's okay now? Is it okay? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, it's this topic of, of ego is so interesting because everything about the ego is diametrically opposed to bhakti. Like I want, I want, I want to be honored. I want to be respected. I want to be praised. 
Like, why? Why? Makes me feel good. Yeah, but it's it's that, you know, trying to be God complex that we all have to deal with. And like you were saying, if we're going to learn to depend on Krishna, then that ego has to shut up, basically. Because the ego, the, the function of the ego is to take credit. And so Krishna's not going to empower you if you're going to take credit for it. You know? you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you, you know, $100,000 to help me run my business. Then you're going to walk around and spend it for yourself. I'm not going to give it to you. So Krishna is going to give you so much, and then you're going to spend it for yourself. No. But when you're humble, then he'll give it because you can use it. Right? So um, let's do a little practice, Pai. We can all do this today. Let's live today without false ego. Let's just be humble today. Try it on, you know, see how it feels. You know, just like don't, don't look for respect. Don't think about being respected. You know, if you make a mistake, just tell everybody in the universe, I'm so stupid. I, you know, I did this today. I poured water in a glass that had a hole in the bottom and my whole floor in the kitchen is wet. I'm so stupid. You know, just try to be humble for a day, see what happens. It's either going to be the best day of your life or the worst day of your life. And if it's the worst day of your life, then you got some work cut out for you. And if it's the best day of your life, just continue. Then you know you have arrived. Yeah, you have arrived at what we call the bliss of being insignificant, you know, like the happiness of being nothing. You know, like as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, you know, everything is backwards from passion to goodness. So, like, like you know, the bliss of being nobody, you know, they, let's let's sell that one in Hollywood, right? Every nobody in Hollywood is. And I say Hollywood, I mean Los Angeles. Every nobody in Los Angeles is trying to pretend like they're somebody. How do I know? Because I grew up there and saw it. You know, and saw it. Well, it wasn't so bad when I was young, but it got worse. So the bliss of being nobody, you know, you can just like, and you know, you know the people who are really trying to be nobody in in L.A. You know who they are. It's the movie stars, because they're like, they're too much somebody. They're like, you know, their egos are like way over taxed. You know, they need, they just, I was just listening to an interview with one famous person. He goes, he, it was Ringo Starr and Paul McCartney. He said, it's so good. We wear masks and we, we just go out and nobody knows who we are. It's like fantastic. Yeah. So their egos are overtaxed. <laughs> You know, whether, you know, anyway, we're, we're trying, we're trying to learn how to be happy being nobody. So try it out today. See if it works for you. Today is, today is happy being nobody day. Put it on your calendar. And we'll celebrate it. If you like it, you can celebrate it every day. Uh, I find it works much better for me because, you know, trying to be somebody is always hard because the curtain always gets pulled on you, you know, when you, you know, the mask gets pulled off, you know, eventually, isn't it? So it's like, it's like easier to just be yourself and there's nothing to pull off. You don't have to protect anything. It's less energy, isn't it? If you got to put all this energy to be somebody else, it's like the end of the day, you're like, wow, that was a tough day. What did you do, Prabhu? What was so tough? I had to pretend to be someone I'm not. That took all my energy, isn't it? Uh, this is we have a, a humility course and and this is often the realization at the end of the course wow it's just so much easier to be who i am to try to pretend to be someone else it's just like i could save so much energy so you can all try it today it might be the most energetic day of your life you don't have to like you know pump up your ego every five minutes okay I don't, that was quite an answer to a question like that uh, it's just, just my realization. Pi, yeah. No, oh, it's P, P, oh, P. Okay, that's good. So when I say your name, I don't get hungry anymore. P. Well, I could think of peas. I kind of like peas. I guess I'll, 
pie will make me more hungry than peas. That's for sure. I was just listening today about the benefits of fasting. You should all fast. Don't eat anything for a month. You'll be super healthy. <laughs> should we all do a one month fast again? P, P. Okay. Well, we came to the end. Anything else? We have a few minutes to talk about false ego, my favorite topic. So um, false ego is, you know, it's subtle, so it's difficult to understand because you can't put it on a table and measure it and, you know, study it in your chemistry class, even though it's an element. But the idea of false ego is to take credit the false ego wants to take credit and it wants everyone to know that we did something and get and it's especially good for the false ego when everyone else tells us now if you have a problem where you really need people to tell you how great you are well number one that is a problem and if you have that problem you're going to make a lot of enemies because i can guarantee you everybody's not going to tell you how great you are and a few people will tell you how bad you are so for big false egos, they don't like that. And they get in a lot of fights and arguments and dislike people and lots of resentments and grudges because all these people didn't tell them how great they are. Isn't it? I mean, yeah, so it's a liability if we, if we have this need to be honored, even appreciated, I'll call it a human need to be appreciated, but if it's excessive to the point where I'm depending on other people to, um, honor me, respect me, appreciate me so I can be normal, then you put yourself in a very volatile position because it's not their job to do that. Maybe your husband or wife, or, you know, your, your mother or father, but even not completely. You can't depend entirely on somebody to put you back together. So um, there, you know, I, I think we could say, I think we all know there is, something we could call appreciation addiction or honor addiction or respect addiction you know daksha had it like he had a problem because she lord shiva didn't stand up when daksha came and daksha got very angry so he you could say he had that respect addiction you know shiva broke the protocol so it can create many problems right yeah so um, I just was reading this. Uh, I'm working on my uh, working on the second level of the Japa retreat. It's it's difficult to work on because I have 90 slides and I don't know how long it's going to take to go through them. And it could be level three contained in level one, and I have to send it out to be translated as level two, and I have to figure this out. So stressing me out. I'm stressed out today. Yeah. So, um, so there's, there's a, there's a section in that course, which is really, really important where I, where I, where I talk about Japa as an act of self care. And, um, how, um, You know, Prabhupada talks about like self-care, like, you know, and so part of self-care is also, you know, it has many aspects. The most obvious part for us is just taking care of our spiritual life, but it has components in it because how, how can you care enough about yourself to make sure you always do everything well in Krishna consciousness? Well, then you could say uh, it has an element of self-compassion. Um, some self-confidence, self-appreciation that I can do this, you know, I, like I trust myself, some self-trust that, that I'm, I could even try to do this. It's worth the effort. Uh, Self-love, I am worth the effort. So when you have more of that, you have less of a need to be appreciated. And uh, one psychologist pointed out to me, 
she said that humble people can make fun of themselves in public. And say, you know, I used to do this, I'm so stupid, you know, only stupid people do that. And I'm like number one stupid because I did it. They can say these things because they, that's how they feel. And, you know, it doesn't bother them if other people see them as they are. And, and because they don't need the applause of other people because they're okay with themselves. Then I read a really interesting article and they used the word, they coined the term comparanoia, where you compare yourself to other comparanoia, like paranoia, comparanoia, where you, you, uh, we're all comparing ourselves to others. And that's a real problem. And then, you know, we get validation from other people that were good or better. And in Krishna consciousness, you're not trying to be better. Just trying to be better than you were yesterday. Better than you want to be better than someone, be better than yourself. <laughs> um, I have to say something. I don't know if we can incorporate this within the job. But I think we have to stop now, right? Did we stop already? Is this new? No? No. Should we stop now? Yeah, we can officially stop now and dwell in comparanoia. I'll just.